Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with the congregation in all seasons and all natures of life, including when the tech is challenging. Yes, we are blue in image, but not in spirit. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and sexual orientations, gender uh, identities, social and economic situations, politics and abilities. We advocate for human rights. We strive to be good stewards of this earth. And in that spirit, we recognize how we are in relationship and how we respect the requests of us in our relationships. We take a moment in our service uh, to honor the Peoria people for this is their ancestral home. They and many other tribes were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. And so we take a moment in service to recognize the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us in person and online. We recognize how important it is to gather in community, to be in each other's presence in all the ways that we can, to expand our circles of care and kindness. So if you are new to us, please help us get to know you, wear a name tag, ask all the questions. We are totally happy to have the conversation. And I invite folks to stay for coffee and conversation after the service in Fellowship Hall if you're joining us in person or online if you are on Zoom. And yes, the Zoom looks blue. That's simply how it's going to be. All right. Uh, we do have some control over devices in our lives. Please turn your respective devices to worship mode, whether silent or vibrate. Thank you. And I have a few notes for today. Uh, uh, later this afternoon, folks will gather in Fellowship Hall for Mahjong. Uh, it's a wonderful chance to play, to get to know people. I mean, what a great way to pause on kind of a rainy afternoon, right? Uh, also, uh, something we just added to the schedule on this coming Wednesday evening, uh, leaders will present a preview of the budget for the coming year. Uh, Linda will, Fairbanks will talk more about that. It will be in person and online. We really want people to join and have the conversation, so please come. This coming Sunday, uh, next Sunday, the June 2nd, I can't believe it's June already, is our annual flower communion. Uh, this is a ritual particular to Unitarian Universalists. It comes to us from the religious pluralism that we knew in Europe, that we still know in Europe. So I invite folks to come and bring a few flowers, add to our common base, and then we get to take home something different than what we brought. Uh, it is a moment of gathering and celebrating and, and cherishing the community that we create together in all of the unique parts that make it up. And by all means, stay for the congregational meeting after the service next Sunday. It's our annual meeting. We do leadership voting. We do budget voting. It's a very important conversation. And there will be a little bit of pizza to help get us started. And child care as well. In two weeks, uh, in two weeks on June 9th, all are welcome as we take the annual field trip out to the Herm Farm and have our annual church picnic. We share brunch. We gather a little bit earlier and share brunch, have a short service, honor our volunteers, and just have a good time. Uh, and the flyer for that is available. By all means, if you're wondering, you know, should you come? By all means, you should and bring a friend. And now I invite Linda Fairbanks forward for an update on our annual campaign. Good morning, everybody. Um, I am Linda Fairbanks, president of the church board, and it is my honor to serve this congregation. Um, I wanna thank Galen Fadley um, for chairing the annual campaign. He's getting towards the end of the project, and I just wanna highlight what a terrific job he's done. He's been so dedicated, finding time from his demanding job and busy family life with Tricia and two little boys, Parker and Emerson. He got a day off today, so he couldn't be here, and that's why I'm here. So thank you, Galen. I hope you enjoy this day. I also want to thank each of you. 
each and every one of you that pledged to the campaign. I'm happy to share that 180 pledges are in, and I have an update from this total. We have raised $327,935 toward our goal for operating this church in the year ahead. Ten of those pledges are new pledges, so thank you all. We're closing in on the goal, um, got a ways to go, but to put it in perspective, there are just 17 pledges that were made last year that we have not yet heard from this year. If those 17 members pledged the same amount as last year, we would reach our goal. We are that close. We are following up with folks and hopefully in the next week we can uh, close that gap. Our pledges make up 80% of the budget to run this church. And as Rev. Jennifer noted, a week from today, members will be asked to make big decisions about the budget at the June 2nd congregational meeting. That's not a lot of time to absorb a lot of information. And I know we do have many new members going through this process for the first time. So the leadership team invites you to an informal sneak preview of the operating budget on May 29th at 6.30 p.m. We'll gather here in the church and we'll have it available by Zoom. A PDF copy of the proposed budget will be available in the UU members folder on Tuesday, and it will be shared on screen during the meeting. Lindy Peterson, I think you guys all know Lindy Peterson. I think she does everything in this church. Um, she chaired the budget development team this year and she will step through the details and respond to questions and suggestions. So please, if you haven't yet pledged, do so in the next 72 hours. It is vital for the success of this church. If you have already pledged and would consider increasing that pledge, that would be amazing. Thank you. I'll just offer the goal, if we, were, if we reached that 360, there was this possibility of hair color on the minister. I think we get a preview of that today. Can we get, get with the blue? It's only because it's not blue. It's the, it is the only thing that's not blue. Oh, I didn't even know how the stole would look. Check that out. I know, right? This is all wrong, but it's all right. It is okay. You got the green working. See, this is... Church is a work in progress, in case you were wondering. We are always in beta, we are always learning, and we are always have an opportunity to try something new and to see a new experience when it shows up without even asking. All right. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join me for our opening hymn number 126, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
Please be seated. Our House of Many Stories by Reverend Scott Taylor. We gather as a house of stories, many stories, woven fine. As we listen to the tales of those who have gone before, the way in front of us becomes more clear. As we make space for voices long silenced, all of us become more free. As we hear the accounts of those who made it through the dark, courage reigns on each and every one. These stories, friends, I need yours as you need mine. It is how we become whole. Yes, we gather as a house of many stories. Come, let us listen once again. Vessels of Life-Saving Welcome by Reverend Michael J. Tino. The flaming chalice was first used by the Unitarian Service Committee as a symbol of life-saving refuge for people fleeing persecution in Europe. As we light this chalice, we invoke the love that called people to put their lives at risk to save others. May we be vessels of life-saving welcome. This is the time of the service <clears throat> for entering into reflection, meditation. This is the time when folks are welcome to come forward, light a candle at our tables. Let that be an expression of what is in your mind or on your heart, with or without words inside. Sometimes it is enough just to light a little light in the world. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
Thank you to all who lit candles in the presence as we are gathered, who might have been so in your own space online. It is welcoming to have such light. Let us enter into this moment of offering the joys and sorrows of the congregation. I want to offer a note of sympathy uh, to Edward Flint, whose mother passed away peacefully at her home in Connecticut on, May, on Friday, May 10th. As we gather on this Memorial Day, I offer a prayer from the Reverend Barbara Peskin. Spirit of life, whom we have called by many names in thanksgiving and in anguish, bless the poets and those who mourn. Send peace for the soldiers and the people who did not make the wars, but whose lives were consumed by them. Let strong trees grow above graves far from home. Breathe through the arms of their branches. The earth will swallow your tears while the dead sing. No more, never again. Remember me. For the wounded ones, and for those who received them back, let there be someone ready when the memories come, when the scars pull and where buried metal moves, and forgiveness for those of us who were not there, for our ignorance. And in us, veterans in a forest of a thousand fallen promises, let new leaves of protest grow on our stumps. Give us courage to answer the cry of humanity's pain. And with our bare hands, out of full hearts, and with all our intelligence, let us create the so needed peace. Let us pause for one more moment of shared quiet. And I invite us to breathe in this moment the one moment we know we have. Let us pause and breathe. Shalom, salam, amen, and blessed be. And now I'd like to invite Jean Sloan forward for our story today. Good morning. Our story today is by Kate Farrell and Caitlin Kuald, and it's called V is for Voting. A is for active participation. B is for building a more equal nation. C is for citizens' rights and our duty. D is for difference, our strength and our beauty. E for engagement, we all need to care. F for a free press to find facts and share. G is for govern, to lead and to guide. H is for homelands we've, that we've occupied. I is for inching ahead bit by bit. 
The march is a long one, but we cannot quit. J is for judges. They're meant to be fair, to be neutral, unbiased, objective, they swear. K is for knowing that you can take part. L is for local, and that's where you start. M is for matter, and every vote does. N is for never forgetting what was. O is for onward, keep progress in sight. P is for protest when we need to fight. Q is for questions. I've got one or three. R is for represent. They work for me. S is for suffrage, the right to a vote. This fight is ongoing, not history's footnote. T is for talented teachers in schools. Well-informed citizens don't suffer fools. U is for unbought, unbossed, undeterred. V is for voting to make your voice heard. W is working for change, win or lose. X marks the spot on the ballot you choose. Y is for you. We need everyone's hand. Z is for zeal. Please bring yours. Take a stand. Thank you very much, Jean. What a great story. And now I want to invite the children and youth and adults uh, working with them to uh, go to your program for today. I think it's mostly about tidying up the RE wing. Yes, it's a very good thing to do. Let us sing. As a congregation that is really, every member has a part in the life of the congregation. Every member, every friend, every child, all the people. We recognize the power of showing up as we are asked to do with such actions as voting. And we recognize the power of showing up as people do with giving as well. This is a moment where we'll receive the, the weekly offering and make a tangible practice of the spirit of giving and abundance and generosity. And we also share a portion of that financial abundance with our community through our Share the Plate practice. Uh, over the course of every given month, one third of the undesignated offering goes to our uh, monthly recipient. In this case, uh, this is the last Sunday of the month, so this is the end of our time. We'll be collecting for the NAACP of Peoria. Uh, they were founded in 1915, and it works for justice and equity in all aspects of life, voting, housing, education, employment, ju the judicial system, and boy, the work goes on. So we need all the help we can offer. So thank you for your generosity in the share of the plate and for all the ways that you give. Please designate, if you have a, an envelope or go to the QR code, please designate where you'd like your gift to go uh, above and beyond maybe a pledge. And thank you very much for your gifts. And now I invite the ushers to come forward.
Our reading for today is Democracy's Benediction by the Reverend Lucas Hergert, serves in our congregation north of Chicago. He says, We are democracy, unruly, unfinished, unrelenting. People of rebellious joy taking to the streets, underground resilience resisting complacence, the pleasure of activism and organizing into simple hope. We are democracy, people of principles taking on principalities, witnessing the worth of those called unworthy, justice now gaining ground, integrity of interdependent existence, existence extending living democracy in hands, heads, and hearts. We know that democracy can die, ossify, brittle byproducts of bygone idealists, plotting politicians, pirating votes. Say that one more fast. Corporations cannibalizing our care for the world. Look, it can wither, distend, and come to an end. Democracy, today, we will love you alive, make you ours, make you thrive, and vote as though our hope is on the line. Here ends the reading. Please rise, embody your spirit, and join me for our hymn number 159, This Is My Song. So as I came upon thinking about this Memorial Day weekend, it seemed a fitting moment to offer another note about democracy and what I'm calling the occasional series this year. It certainly is present on our minds how we have a say in our world, in our lives, in our governance. So I'm curious. I wanted to offer a little opportunity here. Uh, some of you might have seen me post on Facebook and on the church internal email group, I would love to know, you can pause and take a moment to think about how, how do you participate as a citizen? How 
you take part in this community, in this civil society, not always civil, but it is a civil society. What are some of the ways that you show up, that you act up? Please. Yes, Jean. Bring up the topic of democracy. Yeah, when you're sitting around the table. Yeah, ooh, I like that. Yeah, thank you, Jean. Yes, Kate. Yeah, so still voting even when you really don't like the options because better to act than to not. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Who else, how else do you show up in our society? Yes. Yep, letters, petitions, for or against, signing petitions, something that will make a change, yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. So watchdog, all the leadership, and calling for disclosure and information. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a lot. Yes. Finding the energy to stay informed when you would just as soon watch YouTube videos. Can I get a witness? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes, Sandy. Participating in voter registration. Yes, absolutely, yes, because I know I know a bunch of you do like our volunteers with the voting process. Here, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, candidates not perfect, parties not perfect, but still vote. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, here, uh, Jamie, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, the small things, the small things really add up and make a difference. Yes. Postcards you will never meet in other states. You, you, the vote loves that action, right? Ooh, there, that's coming up. That's coming up. Yep. Yes, Jean. Call. Mm hmm. Call legislators. Yep. Mm hmm. Call reps, uh, right? And they are. Right. Call your reps because they they are they are accountable to us and they should be. All right. Yes, one more. Actions. Oh, the difference between actions for progress and actions for harm reduction. Yes, the range of actions is pretty wide. Those are two important categories. Thank you. All right. Well, I think you've covered a lot of territory. Thank you. 
for that. I want to think about, and so as we're thinking about this, I want to invite us to think a little further into when did, in a broader sense, when did you first become involved in in our social context, in, in as a citizen? When did you first become involved? What's the first memory, if you will? So just think on that, because I want to let me offer the one that I'm going to go back to. And here's what, it's one that I have both a memory of, I remember the moment, and there's photographic evidence. This was July 4th, 1976. So again, if I'm from a very small town in Massachusetts with a town common. And there was a parade for the bicentennial, right? And there is some photo, and I think I, rem- I do actually remember this. There is a photo of me someplace, my father probably has it, of me dressed in a long ruffle, white ruffled dress, I think with a blue apron, and one of those kind of white pillowy Betsy Ross hats with the, with the edging there. Yeah. I'm like, you know this big. It was adorable. Yes. But I was in that parade. I was part of that gathering. And I remember that. And I would count that as being out and active. One of the next ones I remember uh, in particular was when I was in high school. And my mother was particularly active in the pro-choice efforts in Massachusetts, both politically and socially in many ways. And uh, she would bring me down to, on occasion, bring me down to Worcester, Mass, the center of uh, the city of Worcester, um, to the Planned Parenthood on Saturday mornings because that's when they performed the surgical abortions. And she brought me down as part of the effort to be clinic escort. I'm in high school and I'm getting clinic escort. This is, that was kind of wild, I'm going to say. But it was powerful to be there. So just think for a sec. What was that early moment for you, showing up in public? And how did those moments maybe make a difference in how you understand how to be in our society? I'm going to keep on going here. So I'd love to hear about those after the service or share amongst yourselves after the service. In my previous message about democracy, I think it was the beginning of March, I talked about being informed. The first of Richard Haas's list of being an engaged citizen in his book, The Bill of Obligations. When I spoke about democracy in that earlier installment, I talked about being in the New England town meeting, I think, uh, attending that on occasion with my parents. Among other things, that was my part of my first early conversation about civic budget discussions. I mean, woo, baby, but really, money, right? It makes a difference. And how do people talk about where they place their value is a deeply important piece of education. Richard Haas, uh, in this moment, he proposes this companion to the Bill of Rights in his Bill of Obligations. So the first one is be informed, and the second one is get involved. So that's what we're looking at in this moment, is that get involved. And for sure, Haas means voting. And he says, voting is the most basic act of citizenship. It creates a bond between the individual and the government, and between the government and the country. And it gives the individual standing in the political arena. Now, I had a refresher on that in the role and the power of voting and relationship. Uh, Earlier this month, Equality Illinois organized its LGBTQIA Advocacy Day in Springfield on May 8th. And Regina Stanley, Jesse Laughlin, and I participated and ended up, we we all uh, went down to Springfield, and we ended up grouped together with other folks from Peoria, uh, because we were all kind of trying to visit our respective uh, uh, elected leaders, and and that group included folks from Peoria Proud and P Flag in particular. 
And the opening rally for this advocacy day, it was really well organized. I highly recommend attending these. The opening rally uh, speakers reminded all of us that the Capitol was and is the people's house. I hadn't, been, I hadn't heard that in a long time, and it was just such a wonderful singular image. This is the people's house, and we have a right to be here and to speak. And we did. We met folks. We talked to elected officials and left messages for them to promote certain legislation. And we also had a chance to observe other groups doing similar work for different uh, other motivations. I think there was one, it was a really big group, um, African-American, Latinx groups who were part of, I think, uh, labor efforts, for example. And it was all within the people's house. And this is the people's work. The diversity of that moment brings to mind the value of diversity of engagement in people. I turn to Reverend Dr. James Luther Adams, who is one of our Unitarian Universalist theologians of the 20th century. Uh, he's one of our common touch points for calling the liberal church into action for recognizing and acting in that liberal spirit, the one that's open to information, to discovery, and acting in, in that openness, it is a way to act against fascism. One of his core tenets is how we are, we should freely consent to gather. That any gathering, any relationship, as much as possible, should be based on consent and not coercion. He recognizes that we have involuntary relationships like the family in which we are born, for example, and so on. But the power of the diversity of voluntary relationships, of voluntary organizations, it provides a variety and purpose and a wide range of expression that meets all the wide range of needs in our human experience. He says, the voluntary organization provides the opportunity for ever wider and wider dispersion of responsibility for the, for the displacement of hierarchy. Say that again. The voluntary organization provides the opportunity for ever wider and wider dispersion of responsibility for the displacement of hierarchy, meaning we should have a lot of groups because then the guys who want to control, okay, it's not just guys, but it's a lot of guys, the folks who want to control, they can't, get a, they can't get a hold. They can't say we are one up and we're better. You want to disperse power and still have lots of power within all the people. And he's talking about this in part in relationship to the free church. The church, the, the earliest Christian church, if you will, existed by the choice of the people. And that is the, that's his kind of foundational uh, image is the early Christian church. It was a free church that organized and advocated. In other words, what he's saying, don't, don't abdicate or let go of power or responsibility. Don't hold all of it either but don't release it. Don't let somebody else take it away. It occurred to me, we had a, uh, in our local conversation about the Faith Coalition for Racial Equity recently, we had a conversation about why we have so many groups in Peoria. Why can't all these groups working for people's health, for, pe for the sake of justice and so on, why can't they all coalesce into one group that works together? And we all knew that wasn't going to happen because we have so many different perspectives and people. I think the ability to organize, the simply the ability to freely choose how to organize, empowers us, but it also helps us parse out our particular needs and questions. Human beings like to do things their way, right? We like to keep being human 
and creative and come up with a different question than our neighbor. We need so many ways of, and avenues of action because we can't help ourselves by having different questions, but also having multiple groups in different ways. And I'm going to say groups, not just like the CO2 uh, folks, you know, power to them, but not just uh, folks working you know, towards a more racially just community against police violence or gun violence and so on. But the ways we gather, I think, include all of the ways that we gather, all of our social engagements. We have Juneteenth coming up uh, in the community in a couple of different ways. All of these ways in which we get together and the book discussion about the Bill of Obligations that was recommended to me in the first place. We have a disbursement of ways of action so that we can be flexible and responsive and also so we can overlap in circles and find each other. Like the Faith Coalition for Racial Equity, we have this conversation about the CO2 pipeline as a result, for example. We also were able to uh, show up and be, we have overlapping relationships uh, in the affirming faith communities. We have relationships in trying to be in balance with the Jewish community, with the Islamic community in this particularly fraught moment. It gives us a way to heal and flow and still be connected. Sometimes, now sometimes we need to know when a project is complete and move on. Sometimes, you know, committees linger way past their expiration date. Can I get an amen? And, but the range of ways in which we are part of and participation in our citizenship helps us be responsive. We get to know the multitude of each other's dimensions. And it also brings us outside of our any one perception and work with a larger purpose and a larger social context. The point in this moment I want to offer is in a time when so many of us feel discouraged and disempowered, let us locate that power in diversity of form and activity, and a way, an expression of pluralism, as this theme is for the month, of free association, all of these being necessary ingredients for a free society and disempowering fascism and authoritarianism. James Luther Adams, having seen the rise of fascism and the lack of response from the liberal churches in Europe in real time, continues to call us to act and not give in to inaction or ignoring the problems. Some of us have been acting, truly acting for all of our lives as well. I know the degrees in each of us is different. It really has. I do want to talk about how it makes a difference in the longer run and how we have an opportunity here. Last. Uh, a little bit last week, May 17th, people all across the country honor the 20th anniversary of Goodridge versus the Department of Health in the state of Massachusetts. That court decision granted freedom to marry for same-sex couples in that state. It was the first state to secure that right. And I will take a little collective pride in how Unitarian Universalism showed up in that moment it so happens that Hillary Goodridge, one of the plaintiffs, was on staff with our Unitarian Universalist Association. And there was another couple, uh, Gary Chalmers and Rich Linnell, who were active in raising their daughter at the congregation, the UU congregation where I grew up. So not a surprise, but it, it's lovely to know how we show up, right? So consider... Since May 17, 2004, when the first licenses were issued, our younger generation were in a world where people had freedom to marry in this country. Now, it was another 11 years before marriage equality was decided nationally, but it was there. Our children have a world in which this freedom is present in our society. They operate from a different paradigm as a result. 
And our task is in part holding the line of emerging liberation as it has been in so many forms as the younger generation comes into their adulthood and into their power. How do we help them on the way? I think that B is for voting book is a really good instrument. Just recognizing this anniversary for me affirms how we show up and should keep showing up because that work started years before the decision happened, right? How we keep calling for a society that respects inherent worth, advocates for justice, seeks balance with our environment, and much more. I recognize that to be active is to risk, to offer our energy and our hearts and our lives. It is to risk becoming cynical, bitter, depressed, and hopeless because so much doesn't go to plan. I know some of the recent lack of support against the CO2 pipeline is discouraging here. And when the Supreme Court undid Roe versus Wade, I know some of you couldn't face the prospect of fighting that fight again, even though you have all the wisdom. So I won't deny the feelings. And frankly, I'll offer that denial of being fully human in our feelings feeds into the rigidity and prison, prison of fascism. So feeling the feelings is acting up. Forget that too. Because how many times our efforts fail, and not just fail, but reverse, as we're seeing in access to health care and access to reproductive health in laws purposely targeting our trans siblings. And just this week, the defeat of an effort in South Carolina to undo gerrymandering, uh, a gerrymandering that reduces the voting power of African Americans and makes it that much harder for people to change leaders with their vote. That was just this week. Richard Haas reminds us, the message that runs through this obligation of get involved is that democracy cannot be a spectator sport. Passivity and opting out simply allow others to choose for you, which most certainly means advancing their preferences and not your own. Given how much is at stake, you cannot defend inaction. It is better to vote. The case for getting involved and remaining involved is overwhelming. Democracy is a form of government that empowers individual citizens, but only if citizens are prepared to get involved. As James Luther Adams points out, the diversity of association of involvement is itself empowering and a strength against those who would limit human rights and would impose their limits upon us. So showing up as a volunteer, as a supporter, as a participant in places such as Religious communities where we freely gather and get to know each other, showing up in all the ways as part of that network that strengthens our capacity, strengthens our will and our ability. And those of us with capacity are called to serve, to listen, to show up, and to witness and listen again. Now, I will say, in closing, I don't think that the girl in the July 4th, 1976 photo would have thought all this at that time. In my first memory of activity. But oh, the places we go and the world we shape as we continue this good work. We are democracy. Lucas Hergert reminds us, unruly, unfinished, unrelenting. We are democracy, and today we will love you alive, make you ours, make you thrive as the vote, and the vote as though our hope is on the line. And so we shall. Let us go forth. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit. Join me for our closing hymn. 
Number 1017, Building a New Way. Our Inner Lights by Amanda Alice Ulihan. Together, we have enjoyed the warmth and beauty of stories of this flame and of this special community. As our chalice flame is extinguished this morning, we can still remember that its glow is carried within us. We can use our inner lights and this flame to kindle new sparks throughout our lives and in the world. May the spirit of peace and togetherness bless your lives. Go now with hearts and hands and minds renewed. Go to the world that is waiting for you. Go out to the world to bring your gentle touch to those who are in need to feed and house the people, to speak truth to those in power. Go out with courage to do the work which calls you. Go now with passion and faith to transform our world. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs>